Luke chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife, watch this, was of the daughters of Aaron. That's very, very important, that his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name, not as important as where she came from, but her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's important. So they are walking upright, they are blameless, and yet they have no child because Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. Last verse. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office, talking about Zacharias, his father, while he executed the office before God in the order of his course. So here's what's, here's what's happening. Um, God is getting ready to start his journey to Calvary. This is where it starts. But he needs somebody to herald or to tell the people that the Messiah is coming because it's been prophesied in Isaiah that one would come before him. Are you with me so far? Well, guess who that is? Who said it? John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus. Right now, at this time, before this, Elizabeth was pregnant with John six months before Mary got pregnant with Jesus. So they got to know each other in the womb before they got to know each other in life. How do I know? The Bible says when they came in the room, their babies leaped. It's very important. I want you to understand what's going on, and, and I'll explain it a little later. But when John was born, he was born at a time where nobody was obeying God. They were not obeying God. He was born in a time where church as usual, according to the priesthood, was corrupt, but because um, nobody had any reason to say anything because sometimes sin makes you silent. People saw what was going on wrong, but they were like, well, I ain't no better, so since I'm in sin, I'm just going to, all right, let me, let me, is there anybody in here that you, you've opted out of correcting somebody because currently you are not correct? So nobody could say anything except for Zacharias and Elizabeth. They have a baby. John messes up everything. Today I want to talk to you about disrupting the order. Some of y'all are accustomed to status quo and you think that because you ain't living right you can't say nothing. And you think that because you haven't accomplished everything that you set out to accomplish that you shouldn't say anything. But is it possible that God brought you into that circle to disrupt the order? Do I have any planet shakers in here today? Who am I talking to? Do I have anybody in here that know that God sent you to shake it up? Do me a favor and touch three people on your way down and say, I ain't perfect, but I'm about to shake it up. I'm about to shake it up. I'm about to shake it up. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I bet you some of y'all have had this conversation already. Have you ever felt like this? Kind of the same shape as everybody. Kind of the same education, but it felt like something made you stand out. Just most people without the ability to see color wouldn't see the difference. There was something called the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect says that a small change 
will somehow cause a larger change somewhere down the line. That's the butterfly effect at its most brass tax explanation. Um, it's the idea that they say that if a butterfly were to flap its wings in California, that sometimes the storm that happens in New York is the result of a lot of butterflies flapping their wings and that wind traveled across the nation. It's called the butterfly effect. That something happens here that causes an even bigger change here. I was telling our staff that if a boat is on a trajectory and it is just one degree off, it won't know that it's actually off course until it gets miles away. Because a small degree of disruption doesn't seem like much of a problem at all at first. But when you add one degree for every step, once you get to the place where you should be at the goal, it is as far to turn around as it is to go back. See, one small decision here can have huge ramifications in the future. Okay? Every once in a while, God will do something subtle that most people will take for granted and not recognize that when you are patient and let God have his perfect work, that that little difference will mean something huge in the future. You know why most people don't save money? Because they think, what good is it to save $5? What good is it to save $10? If you saved it every day, by the time you get to the end of the year, you have $3,000, almost $700. Now you're cooking. But if you look at it from the perspective of it's only $10, then you won't respect it because it's insignificant. But $3,600 some odd dollars, $50, is not anything until you have something that costs $2,000. It's not anything until you have something that costs $3,000. It's not anything until you have an emergency where, oh my God, if I had just saved a couple of dollars every paycheck, then I wouldn't be at the mercy of somebody's interest rate, or I wouldn't be at the mercy of somebody's attitude, or I wouldn't be at the mercy of somebody's injustice, because I did not respect the little thing. I'm getting ready to go somewhere, because when John was born, he wasn't nothing but a little fetus. But when his mama pushed, and gave birth to him, he would change the trajectory of the world. The world that you and I live in was eternally altered when John the Baptist came into the earth. His mama gave birth to him, and the Bible says, according to Luke chapter 1, that he was born at a dark time. When the Bible says he was born at a dark time, it is not talking about chronological hours. It is not talking about that he was born after the precipice of midnight. It is not talking about him being born when the sun goes down. What it is saying that he was born in an immoral season. He was born at a time where men were turning their back on God. He was born at a time where everybody thought that they were the Messiah because they had a few people attending their church. So he was born at a time. That everybody thought that they were anointed. Everybody thought that they were Paul. Everybody thought that they were Zacharias. Everybody thought they were the Messiah. And do you know how I know that everybody had a chance? Because if everybody didn't have a chance, according to their eye, then Herod would not have ruled that all two-year-old babies be killed because they didn't know who it was. So they thought... Oh, my God, it could be your son. It could be your son. It could be your nephew. And so he said, every Jewish baby, two years and younger, kill them until we find out who this Messiah is. And if we kill them all, then we won't give them an opportunity to reproduce. And he heard this after the Magi had went and visited a young boy in Bethlehem. 
And he got the news. This is Herod the Great, who is now the king of Judea. He got the news that there was a young king that was going to be born. And he wasn't really concerned about kingdom. He was concerned about his position. Because he says that he was Herod the Great. And since he was Herod the Great, then that means there could be no king greater than him. So he made sure that anybody who had the potentiality to be king, that he would kill them no matter if they were two years old, three years old, four years old, four months old. It was the first abortionist on earth. He did it in mimicking Pharaoh at the time of Moses. I told you that the Old Testament concealed is the New Testament revealed. It is the same story in a multiplicity of applications. Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses. And Herod wanted to kill Jesus, the same thing, at the same age, at the same time, for the same reason. Because anytime somebody thinks that you can replace them, they want you dead. <laughs> Not necessarily physically, but they'll besmirch your character. They'll, they'll, they'll try to get you fired at your job. They'll go and say little things about you behind your back and tell people, you know what, I see you hanging around so-and-so. The Lord told me to tell you, be careful with the people who are around you. Yeah, okay. That means you too, just so you know. You, you do know that not only do you have to be careful with people who tell you about bones, you got to also be careful with the ones who bring you them. He says, he says, listen, uh, they, they are, they are, they are, he's born and he's, he's, he's born at a time where, and I need you all to follow me on this. Now, I'm not even getting in a rush because we're going to preach this for a while, so I need you to get the foundation. The law, watch this, the Bible says that the law was until the birth of John. That means that the butterfly was in effect. The law was there, and when John came, he disturbed it. See, most people know that Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. But I hate to tell you that before Jesus was ever born, John was already. God help it. The Bible says the law was until John. When John was born, he was the first one to say, I know what y'all saying, but there is one coming. There is one coming, and I have been sent to be his forerunner. In other words, I have been sent to make sure that everybody knows in every direction that he is coming. Who do men say that I am? Some say thou art John the Baptist. John says, please don't confuse me with him. I am not him. I am just one sent before him to let you know there is one coming. Herod, that is greater than you. There is one coming that is the chief cornerstone. There is one coming who is the balm in Gilead. There is one coming who is a healer. There is one coming that makes the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. And I know that you have your gods and you have learned uh, idolatry in the confines of the pyramids of Egypt. And I know that you have learned your language and language from Baal. And I know that you've learned your lingo from all of the idolatry that you have been introduced to. But I'm telling you that there is one coming that's greater than anybody you've ever prayed to. This one that is coming faced off with Baal and, and, and took wet wood and burned it up and Baal couldn't even burn it up when it was dry. Y'all not here with me today. There is one coming and I just came to tell you that whoever you have in your life that is helping you to do this little thing and helping you to pay that little bill and helping you to keep your mind together sometime and, and answers the phone every once in a while when you call and, and you are overly dependent on them. I'm telling you there is one that came that if you would, if you would tell him all of your problems there is one that comes that, that can provide for you when you don't even have employment. There is one. Oh, I wish I had somebody. And, and maybe you've got good friends, but let me tell you, a good friend does not substitute for a good relationship with God. Just a little talk with Jesus. Sometimes you got to talk to people all night for them to understand, but God is so smart. Just a little talk with Jesus. There, there is one coming. Touch somebody say, he came. He came. And when Jesus came and when John was born, watch this, shadow became substance. Don't you miss this because before John, the focus was at Mount Sinai and the focus would shift to Mount Calvary. Do, do you see how the shifting of the focus have? Because they were looking to Sinai because that's where Abraham took Isaac and that's where Moses saw the burning bush. And so that's, that was their mountain of transfiguration. But, but the focus had to shift because there was no blood shed at Sinai. 
See, y'all don't want no real preaching. I'm learning that. I'm learning that. You just want to touch your neighbor and get a blessing. But, baby, I'm going to give you some word today. There was no cross at Sinai. There, not, but it was a shadow because a father had to take his son. Up a mountain, Abraham had to take his son Isaac uh, uh, up a mountain, and out of Isaac will come Jacob, and out of Jacob will come the 12 tribes. Well, then the focus shifts from Sinai to Calvary because a father, Jehovah, would take his son Jesus up a cross, who would be the new Israel pointing to the new Jerusalem, and out of him will come a new nation. God help me in this church. Now, this nation is now quantifiably different because he was the king of the Jews. But we're not Jewish. So how do we get in? How do we get in? The blood. What can wash away my sins? Not the Ten Commandments. Not the law. Not a rosary. Not a confessional booth. Y'all not going to talk to me. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, if y'all were really saved, I couldn't save blood and you not lose your mind. I'm so sick of folks shouting in church about a blessing. I don't know what to do. What you call a blessing is going to break down in three years. What you call a blessing is going to need a new roof in a couple of years. What you call a blessing... It's going to be sick in a couple of years. But when you got the blood, the blood will allow you to walk into a car lot and they say you got a 500 credit score, but we don't know why your credit score went through. The blood will make you walk into the doctor and they'll look at the report and say, last week we saw a spot on your lung, but this week we can't find nothing. Somebody slap somebody and say, thank God for the blood. And it will never. It will never lose its power. How do I know? Because it has covered those of us who are in this room today. And despite our sins and failures, I am on assignment tonight to tell you that it is time for you to disrupt the order. Touch your name and say, I'm getting ready to disrupt the order. I'm getting ready to disrupt the order. I, I, I'm getting ready to disrupt the order. I've, I've had so many poor people in my family, but I'm disrupting the order. I've had sick people in my family, but I'm getting ready to disrupt the order. Prostate cancer stops with me because I'm getting ready to disrupt the order. Drug addiction stops with me because I'm getting ready to disrupt the order. Fatherless children in my family is about to stop because I'm getting ready to disrupt the order. And let me tell you, you don't need an example to be one. You better hear what I just said. I am coming to tell you that God is calling you to do something that you have never seen. He's calling you to be an example and you've never had an example. Nobody in your family has ever been rich, but you're about to be because God is getting ready to use you to disrupt the order. Everybody in your family has gotten a divorce, but not you because you're getting ready to disrupt. Somebody say, shake it up, shake it up. And so Christ takes center stage and now Gentiles have been woven into the fabric of the salvific power of Jesus Christ. I just wish you knew that you shouldn't be saved. I just wish you knew that. I wish you had read your Bible and found out that before Jesus, only Jews had a right to the tree of life. And I wish you knew that the wages of sin was death and the gift of God was eternal life. And I wish you knew that the one lie you told was enough to go to hell. And I wish you knew that Jesus took the focus from Sinai, which was the law, where Moses got the Ten Commandments, and shifted it to Calvary, where Jesus took the nails so that we, the leaves of the tree, might be for the healing of the nation. And now we have been grafted into the fabric of salvation without Jewish descent. Now, here is the problem. Am I helping anybody? Here is the problem. This happened in Herod's life before Jesus because Herod is the king in these dark days. Herod the Great. I've been to Jerusalem. They showed us a mountain. I said, wow, look at that mountain. They said, let me show you something. The mountain that's there, they said it used to be over here. When Herod was alive, he leveled it and built one so that he could show God he was superior. 
See, that's why I think that every Christian needs to go to the Holy Land. You, you, you need to see what you're reading about. Literally, there is a mountain near the Dead Sea that Herod had slaves to break and then reassemble so he can show God he builds mountains too. Oh, God, help me in this church today. The first thing I want you to see is that Herod is the king of Judea. He is not a Jew. How can you be the king of the Jews and you are not a Jew? He leveraged his authority in Rome and got it through politics. The first thing that God is calling us to disrupt is politics. Some of y'all need to get up and go vote. Stop sitting at home talking about, oh, I don't follow it close. Let me catch you up to speed. It's jacked up. You have turned a blind eye to the first thing God wants us to disrupt. And we sit back and we let people who do not have our interests at heart sit on our judicial branches and put our sons in jail for the same weed they smoke. How is it that a judge can sit on the bench and have him a joint for his glaucoma and then put your son in jail for 50 years Y'all don't want to say nothing. But I'm so tired of us complaining and we won't vote. We won't get engaged in politics. And if we don't get engaged, Herod will continue to sit on our throne. Herod was not a Jew, nor was he in the line of David. He had no business being king, but because he had a good stump speech because he had a good campaign bus. He was able to gain authority and positioning and did not have the best interests of the people who he governed. Y'all not, okay. Herod was so ruthless that when he thought his wife was going against him, he killed her. Don't get no ideas, brothers. You ain't no king. You're going to go to jail forever and then two days. <laughs> he killed his sons. He killed his relatives. Anybody he thought was trying to get in your service, he killed them. Because you'll always know a person who cannot handle high positions when they cannot handle competitors. You don't deserve to be king when you have a jealous spirit. You don't deserve to be king or queen when you can't see nobody else win. As if God is running out of resources and that if he don't bless you, he won't have. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof and they that dwell in. Just touch on them and say, I ain't jealous of you. Baby, I want you to win. It's more fish in the sea. If you can get a man and I can get a man, I, I ain't going to be mad at you because you got, I get sick of people rocking, how she get a man and I can't get one? Because you, she, she ain't jealous and you are. You got to be okay with other people being blessed. You can't try to kill everybody that looks like they about to come up and come over. Matter of fact, the only way you can stay in power is to keep people in power. Somebody say politics. John was born when? In darkness. But yet he was the light. Which lets us know that our circumstances should not detect our, detect or depict our greatness. He was born in an immoral time. He was born in darkness and yet he was the one that shined the light on the one who was coming. See, what happens to most of us is we always continuously allow our circumstances to determine who we will become. 
I guarantee you right now, some of y'all are in here right now, you had an attitude when you came and didn't have nothing to do with none of us in here. It has something to do with where you came from, and you came right in here and let the people out there determine how you were going to sit in the house of God. You came in here, you were mad, you had your arms folded, you didn't speak to nobody when you walked in because the boss made you mad, you didn't speak to the usher, you didn't speak to the greeter, you got mad at the parking lot man because he told you to park somewhere where you didn't want to park, you got mad at the usher because she told you to take your purse off the seat and let somebody sit next to you, then you get mad at me because I told you to touch your neighbor, get over yourself and stop being upset in here because of what happened to you out there. I need somebody over the next 30 seconds say, devil, I'm going to stop giving you victory everywhere I go. I'm going to stop giving you victory everywhere I go. You're not going to make me sit in church for 30 minutes and miss what God has to say to me. Devil, get out of my mind. Get off my back. Get off my children. Get out of my money. Get out of my spirit. Can I get some free people in here right now to take control of your own attitude and atmosphere? And over the next 20 seconds, give the devil everything you got and let him know that I've got authority to tread on your head. Your greatness has to stop being limited by what surrounds you. John was born in darkness and he was still in light. You can work with ignorance and still be nice. Can I say something else? You can be married to mean and not become mean. Only reason why I ain't speak to him because he ain't speak to me. You can do better than that. You better stop allowing what people do to you. He ain't say nothing to me, so I ain't say nothing to him. I don't, I don't, I don't trust him, and he don't trust me. I don't respect him. He don't deserve it. When he deserve it, when he respect me, then I respect him. And you don't understand that you're messing up your greatness because you're allowing what's around you to get in you. He was born in the darkness, and he was light. I declare, and I decree, and I propel you to be light in darkness. I tell you, you're the salt of the earth. You don't know who you are. You're supposed to walk into a mean environment and everything ought to shift when you get in there. Can I tell you, the reason why everybody in your office is evil and it don't shift when you walk in is because you are too. If you had light, you'd lighten up that darkness. If you were nice, you'd run the devil the hell out of there. It's the same when you walk in there because you are the same. Slap somebody say, I'm different. Be angry. That's cool. But sin not. The difference between you and I, I get mad. I just don't react the same. People cut me off in traffic. I, 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 uh. But I'll be doggone if I'm going to go 90 trying to catch up with him. Am I going to kill you? You better slow down and just let it go. Some of y'all chase them all the way. You chase them from Sugar Land to Pear Land to catch them and let them know they cut you off. <laughs> then going to come to church and ask God for gas money. <laughs> Something wrong with me, I know. I'm praying on myself. It's time for the church to disrupt politics. You've got to care who your congressmen are. You've got to care who your senators are. Or you will let Herod sit on the bench or let Herod sit in the office because you would not get up and do something about a right that people died for. How dare you allow people's skulls to be fractured and you stay in the house and say, I don't care, my vote don't matter. It does matter. Do you know why? There are no grocery stores in your neighborhood because you don't vote. Do you know why? It floods in your neighborhood and don't flood in other areas because you don't vote. 
If they don't take care of your neighborhood, you get your community together, go down there and get everybody in your community together and y'all vote them out of there and get somebody in there who will do what you say because they work for us and we don't work for them. And when you recognize that, So it's early voting. You can go anywhere and vote. All you got to do is take your ID. And you need to do it. I voted this morning. My mother and I went, my daughter, my wife, we went and voted this morning. It's our responsibility. If you couldn't vote, you'd be marching. Can vote and won't move. There was a study that said that if all of the millennial women would vote, that whoever that block voted for, that's who would win. But by and large, millennial women are so disengaged in this process I'm just tired of it. It's getting on my nerves. I don't want to hear about it. But then when they kick your son out of school, get your John Brown hind parts up and go cast a ballot. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear me what I said? Number two. God is causing us to disturb politics. First, second thing he's calling us to shake up is parenting. See, Zacharias was blessed because his mom and daddy was right. The Bible says that Zacharias was a priest. There are some that say it that at the time that John was born, there were at least 20,000 priests in Judea. 20,000 preachers in the city. How in the world you got 20,000 preachers and everybody going to hell? But there was one walking righteous in the sight of God I guess that's where John got it from. Because his daddy was walking righteous in darkness. John got it from his daddy. You'd be surprised how much your children are like you. Oh, this is going to be good. Lord, this is going to be good. Some of y'all can't stand your children and they just can't stand that little heifer. She thinks she's a woman. You're grown, get your own. Let's go back and talk to your mama. You like to fight just like her? You talk back just like him? You be surprised where they learned it from. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that you, get, you become a parent and you forget what you was? You get to, parent, get to being a parent, all of a sudden you start thinking that, you know, you start believing that you're perfect, and, and you forget that, uh, <laughs> any honest parents in here, come on now, holler at your boy, you, 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 you was tripping, dog, come on now, you, you, had a, you got a couple of tattoos that, that we can't see that, uh, You tried to get it taken off, but it was hurting too bad, so you left it half on and half off. Come on. <laughs> Parenting has lost its art. I don't know what happened when parents thought it was proper to be friends. 
I just want to be friends with my daughter so that way when she decides to do something, at least I know what she's doing. I'm going to let her boyfriend come over my house and let them go up in the room because at least she's here with me. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Nobody, no 14, 15 year old got no business talking about dating and a boyfriend. I just don't want to constrict them like my mom constricted me, so I want to give them freedom. No. It is not your job to give your child freedom, it is your child, your job to give your child direction. You keep talking about being different from your mama, but look where you at on Tuesday. She didn't do that bad. She didn't do that bad. She might not have let you date that little stinking nappy head boy when we was 14 and you ain't never forgave her, but you're still in church on a Tuesday night. She might not have gave you what you wanted, but you're still in church on a Tuesday. She might not have let you kiss him. She might not have let y'all dress alike and go down there to the, to the fair. She might have not let you do it. She didn't let you go to the movie. She ain't let you hold hands. Look where you are. You can do a lot worse than being like your mama. She fed you. She clothed you. Kept you out of jail sometime. You don't win a few times that she ain't know about. <laughs> Zacharias and Elizabeth was 80 years old. Do you know why God picked them? Do you think God wanted to pick 80-year-old people to have a baby? He picked them because he couldn't find anybody with character, so he had to settle for age. He looked for somebody 20, couldn't find them. Looked for somebody 30, couldn't find them. Looked for some, he had to go all the way into the 80s to find some people who were too tired to sin. <laughs> I wonder what... Is it about you that God keeps looking over and selling for somebody less qualified? Because you won't bring to the table what it takes to shake stuff up and be great. He had to settle for age over character because those were the only people he could find. They were not as educated but they were blameless. They were not famous, but they were blameless. They didn't have a whole lot of money. You could tell by the way John dressed. <laughs> Y'all don't read the Bible. You could tell by what John ate. John didn't even have a change of clothes. He hadn't got a haircut in all them years. He ate honey and locusts. You could, he ain't had no daddy. His daddy didn't have no money. He was a priest. If he ain't had no other job, he didn't have nothing. But yet, God picked him. Because his parents shook it up. He said, John, I don't care what anybody else is doing. You're going to live right. I don't care what the mother little boys is doing down there at the school. You're going to pray. I don't care how they dress. You're going to pull your pants up around your waist and put a belt on your butt. Y'all not here with me today. I don't care what the mother boy is doing, but you're not going to have no tattoo on the center of your forehead and on the back of your neck. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. I don't care how much you love him. You better not get his name tattooed on you at no 18 years old. I don't care about y'all getting mad at me. 
because the art of parenting needs to be back. You need to grab your little John and say, you got an opportunity to be great if you'll just keep yourself together. You got an opportunity to do something great if you'll just keep yourself together. God wants to use you, and he wants to use you in an extraordinary way, but you still got to be light and darkness. You don't have to do everything that everybody at the school is doing. You don't have to go to the movies every weekend. You don't have to go out all the time. Sometimes sit down and read a book some weekends. Put something in your head. Y'all not going to pray with me. Y'all not going to pray with me today. I'm telling you, this is good, but y'all want to hear something else. And I'm telling you right now that, parents, it is your responsibility to protect your John so that God can use him or her. Sometimes you just got to say, no, no, you can't go. You don't have to be gone every weekend. No, you can't go. Or, yes, you can go, but that room better be clean before you leave. Those dishes better be washed, and that trash better be taken out. And people who can't clean their room shouldn't be able to stay out past midnight. Now, I know y'all don't want to say man, because your mom did that to you. And you want to be different. You're spoiling your John. Can't nobody tell him nothing, and God can't use him. God says it's time to shake up these parents. It's time to shake up parents. And I know y'all are uncomfortable, but y'all don't mind when I'm talking about your kids, but I'm talking about you. Now you want to sit here and look ashy. I'm talking to you. If I was talking about get them to the altar so they can get their grace together, bring them to the altar. You'd be up here with them. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for finally speaking to the preacher to speak to these bad kids. But now I'm talking to the ones who raised them. Buy no boy, no PlayStation 4, and he ain't got nothing over a D on his report card. Are you out your mind? A PlayStation. You lucky you got food. Some of y'all need to take them cell phones. They need, listen, I, I wish... I, I just feel like doing a parenting class right now because y'all sitting up. I know I'm right because you're sitting up here quiet. I know I'm talking good. They on the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning. Every time you wake them up, they don't want to go to school. They tired because you're too lazy to go up there to make sure they sleep. Or maybe you want them to think you really are and you ain't. Yep, you only three of y'all got it, but it's cool. They won't bother me, I won't bother them. That ought to be something. I can tell you this right now. My mother, I, I never saw my mother with a man she wasn't married with. I didn't get introduced to five people and was told they was my uncle. I can do that too. See, you want good children, but you won't shake up the parenting. There are some disciplines you have to have as a parent if you want John to be able to be in touch with Jesus. I don't care if you're young. They did not ask to be here. Whatever sacrifice it takes to make sure that you raise your children right, it is your responsibility. I'm in my 30s. I'm not about this. You better slow down. And another one. So you, you should see your face. Some of y'all like. I can't believe he just said that. Ah, so get up. See these baby boomer rummers, they know I'm right. You young sister ain't too sure if I'm right yet, but you'll find out in five years I'm right. Snatch them up early. I was, with, I was with Dave Ramsey the other day. He said, he told his kids, he said, uh, I would, if I were you, I'd act right because I really could get rid of you and make another one that looks just like you. I mean, I really could just like get rid of you and make another one that looks just like you.
The reason why I'm telling you to take care of them is because Herod is after them. Herod wants your son. Herod wants your daughter, and he will use opioids, he will use drugs, he will use sex, he will use a grown man and your young daughter. And then you'll be bringing them to me. Those children are important. You love your children, don't you? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sacrificed himself. You cannot raise a child without sacrificing yourself. There's no way to raise a child comfortably. God says, I'm shaking up the politics. I'm shaking up the parents. Lastly, I'm shaking up the priest. The religious priesthood had been corrupted by Herod because he bought his preachers and he told them what to say. They couldn't preach the truth. If they did, they would be killed. See, I ain't going to bother her. I'm going to start talking about y'all because she... She telling the truth. Priesthood was messed up. It bothers me. In order to be a doctor, you got to go take the Hippocratic oath. In order to be a lawyer, you got to pass the bar exam. In order to be a preacher, all you got to do is be able to sing. Some people ain't been called to preach. What happened was somebody came up to him, you look like a preacher, and then they came in and confessed it. Don't study. Don't fast. Don't pray. Don't get no revelation, no manifestation. Don't exegete the text. Don't study context culture. Don't look at syntax. Don't look at aorist tense. Don't know Hebrew, Greek. Don't know linguistics, punctuation marks. Don't even know English. And we have relegated the highest office in the land to anybody who can hoop. The preacher used to have to be called. Samuel used to have to go to his house. And if the oil didn't flow, he wasn't the one. Now people want to be a preacher because they think they can drive the car that we drive. Now they want to be a preacher because they think they can dress. They see a financial benefit from it, and they don't recognize that any time you see a preacher that is extremely benefited, that doesn't rape the church, is because he has another stream of income that's feeding him. I think you need to know that the church don't own my house, I own it. I don't have no parsonages. I don't have no housing allowance. The church don't buy my cars. I buy my cars. And the reason why I decided, because I just decided that I wanted to have more money than y'all was willing to give me. So I opened me up some businesses and got me some companies and got me some streams of income. So just in case y'all start tripping, me and my wife can still go to bed and wake up. Church ain't never bought me a suit. Church ain't never bought me a car. Church ain't never bought me a house. As a matter of fact, can I tell you the truth? Every piece of furniture in every office in the back came out of my house. I furnished the church. It didn't furnish mine. Oh, I wish I had some. I furnished the church. The church didn't furnish my house. I furnished it. Every couch in the back came from my house. When we bought this church, Jackie will tell you, they sent a U-Haul to my house, took all the furniture out of my house, and we sat on the floor while there was furniture in the church. I didn't have furniture in my house to furnish this church. And they're going to ask me, I can get a suit now. I earned it. I earned it. 
I worked for free for a year. They didn't give me nothing. I can earn it. People say, you know, he preached for money and he, he took all the money. Well, you ask me this question. How in the world I took the money and the building got bought? How did I take the money and a $10 million building has only $4 million left on it after four years? I couldn't have been taking the money. How can I take the money when every, all 60 staff members have been paid on time every time? How could I took the money? There's not ever been one check late bounced in the history of this church. We own everything we got. Every light is paid for, every speaker is paid for, every bus is paid for, every chair is paid for. No outstanding debt other than the loan on the building. Everything else is paid for. I earned the right to have a shoe every once in a while. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Some of y'all be sitting out there hating, but then asking God to bless you. You better ask him to bless me because the oil flows down. If you want me broke, you better get used to it. If you want something, you better celebrate it. Give your neighbor high five. Say, I want my pastor doing well. Even if you don't mean it, you better say it. Because I'm going to do it. Yes, I am. My wife going to drive whatever she want to drive. I remember when she was walking. I remember when we were living in a one-bedroom apartment. I remember she ain't have a stove to cook food on. Whatever she wants, she going to get. I made up a long time ago. I ain't going to let no church run me into no corner to be who they want me to be. And then when I die, you'll have another one in 30 days. The devil is a lie. And for everybody who thinks that you made me, I only ask you to do one more thing. Make another one. And when you do that, then I'll believe you. And there's an old song in the church that says this, before I take it back, I tell you I'll add, add more to it. I ain't scared of y'all. Ain't never been. Ain't gonna start now. You got to be called. Moreover, you got to be chosen. You better stop running up here in this light because it do two things. It'll burn you and it'll expose you. You better stay out there in the audience where you can hide and keep on sinning and won't nobody know it. You can have three boyfriends out there. Won't nobody know. Get up here. They'll find out. I had one lady talking about her kids was mine. I ain't meet her till the kids was nine. Now, how that work? You better stay out there. <laughs> Don't fool with this thing up here. This ain't, this, ain't, this ain't what you want. Where was I? Because I got lost. I just went all the way off, didn't I? I have, I just went, what was I saying? Oh, okay, yeah. The priest. I just went off. Steve, it's your job to keep me, you the security. You're supposed to keep my mind right, man. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to let y'all go. Zacharias was a priest. John came to be the voice because the priesthood had been corrupted. So God uses the crucifixion to adjust it. So the reason why he is the high priest is because he did away with the priesthood because it had been so corrupted it could not be brought back. 
So prior to Jesus, you had to go to the priest to atone for sin. Okay? Catholics still practice this. You would have to go to the priest and say, Father, I have sinned. This is what I've done. But the problem is, is that the person you're confessing to. And we have fact, if you'll watch the news, is just as corrupted as the one who's confessing. So God says, I'm going to do away with that. I am now the high priest. And you no longer have to go and tell a sin-filled man about the repercussions of your sin. Now you can say, Father, I stretch. Hallelujah. I came to tell every person in here today that the next time you need to pray, you can go to God for yourself. Touch your name and say, I'm the priest at my house. Every one of you have been given the royal priesthood over your home. That means before you ever bring your baby to the altar, you should have prayed over him in the bedroom. I decree and declare you need to go to Walmart and get you some olive oil and put it before the Lord and touch every doorknob, every window sill, every steering wheel. I dare you to put it on your child's head while they're in the bed. I dare you when your husband is acting up, just pour oil on him. Wake up in the morning, he got grease all on his face. Tell him, I don't know what happened. It must have been the Lord. He is the high priest, so the veil has been torn. And now you can go straight to the Father because the focus is no longer on Sinai, it's on Calvary. Are y'all here with me today? Somebody shout, I came to disrupt it. You have been called to disrupt the order. destroy the plan and rebuild it. And there are three areas that God is calling us to politics, parenting, and priesthood. If you can do it in the community, if you can do it in your house, and you can do it in the church. And you've got to be in all three of those places. And somehow... We think that now all we have to do it is in the house but not at church or at the, house, at the church and not in the house or, or I, can, I don't have to be in the community. You're called to all three. Your neighborhood is your responsibility. Your church is your responsibility. Your family is your responsibility. And we got to stop outsourcing our deliverance to politics and politicians and government programs and although they are supposed to do the bulk of the work because they got the bulk of the money you got to do your part no more status quo you got to be a different kind of parent one that is an example for your children in the best way you can ain't nobody perfect but you got to do the best way you can and let me tell you something I'm gonna say this and it's gonna throw you off and I'm done I'm not saying that you're gonna do everything right but you need to make sure that you do everything right in front of them. What music do you listen to when they're riding with you? It's okay to listen to Drake when you're by yourself, but when your three-year-old in there with you? Everybody can't be in the club getting tipsy when your three-year-old is in the back seat. Or they sleep, they don't hear it subconsciously. Don't cuss in front of your children. Don't drink, don't smoke in front of them. If they're going to have the habit, let them learn it on their own. Come on, y'all. My mama's 65 years old. I ain't never seen a drink. I ain't never seen a smoke. I ain't never heard a cuss. First time I heard a cuss was at me, and I was grown. I deserved it. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can do this. 
It's going to be a sacrifice. Maybe you never heard this before. Maybe it was a tough pill to swallow, but you needed it. The things that you need are not always easy to digest. I made up my mind a long time ago that I would never be the kind of pastor to cater to your, to your I would never just cater to what you just wanted to hear. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear and what you need to hear. I found out in my life that that's what people loved about me the most. I used to hide from it. I used to get up there, and I've been preaching 23 years. I used to get up there and just tell all this stuff and then got home and felt like, uh, that, that wasn't what the Lord wanted me to say. I, I've been called to disrupt the order. I, I've been called to be different. I've been called to be different. And they ain't know who John was until it was all over, and they might not know who I am until I'm long gone, and that is fine with me because my purpose in the earth is not to satisfy people. My purpose in the earth is to find rejected people and let them know that God can use you in spite of whatever has happened to you in your life. If you're here today and you believe that you've been called to disrupt some order, just stand to your feet. I'm not going to have you come forward. Just stand wherever you are. If you believe you're a disruptor, like, like God sent you there to shake that thing up. I appreciate you too. Is there anybody here that feels like God is calling you to disrupt some order? You're not like anybody in your family. You're not, you're not like anybody in your family. Who am I talking to? You're not. When you come around, they'd be like, where's she come from? <laughs> Any black sheep in the family? How many of y'all feel uncomfortable when you get around them? You just, you can tell they're looking at you and judging you and smell judgment on them. You be looking at them, you don't like me and I don't like you either. Hey, how you doing, Shantae? <laughs> I found out something that I want to share with you. You really think people don't know, but they do know how great you are. They do know. And they can't figure out how you raise those kids by yourself. And they had help and they struggled. They can't figure out. See, you really think that they looking down at you, they really admire you. They can't figure out how in the world did you make $10 an hour and raise those kids and not lose your house. Or you, and, and, and I made such and such and I couldn't do it. So you think they looking down on you, but they really admire you. How is it? that you didn't give your daughter nearly what I gave my daughter, but y'all still close and, and mine don't even talk to me. They can't figure it out. And you think they judge you, they really are admiring you and what they don't know how to say is, you're an awesome person. You shook it up. You are a world changer. You were the rejected stone and now you are the chief cornerstone. And no weapon formed against you was able to prosper. And you have overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony. And you were patient when you wanted to cuss. And you stood still when you wanted to run. And when they broke your heart, you wanted to break their neck, but you stood still. Don't tell me you didn't want to get even. Don't tell me you didn't want to get back. Don't tell me you didn't want to put their business in the street, but God held you and said, no. You're bigger than that. I'm, I've got a bigger purpose for you. I can't have you fighting battles that I didn't assign you to. I can't have you fighting people who, who don't. I can't have you doing. I've got a bigger thing. You, you, you got to introduce somebody who's coming. Be not weary. Who am I talking to? Be not weary in your well-doing. For you will reap a harvest if you faint not. And every tear that you've cried had a purpose to it. And every heartbreak you felt had a purpose to it. Because God came to shake up the order. Because had you been comfortable, you would have stayed and you would have did 
what they did and you would have acted like they acted and you would have spoke the same language that they spoke but God called you out from among them and called you to do something else and he put you in the wilderness and he put you in isolation and he made you lonely so you would not depend on them so you would say what a friend I have in Jesus all of my sins and griefs to bear what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer do I have any God chasers in the room You watch what I said. It'll come to pass. You were the only one in the family who thought you were the least. They always knew it was something special about you. They always knew it. They didn't say it to your face, but they said it behind your back. And you made it. And you survived. With scrapes, you made it. Tears coming down your eyes, you made it. Heart in your hand, you made it. Feelings in your stomach, you made it. Hating your own reflection and you made it. Still not welcome in certain parts of your family. Still not welcome in certain sections. Still not welcome, but you made it. Because God was trying to show you you never needed any of them. now what you have to do is you just have to go ahead on and settle on the fact that you're different <laughs> you're different we ain't nothing but a band of misfits in here you're different you're not the same I've got two minutes of prayer in me every person who knows you're different pray over you for two minutes and I'm going to let you go. If you know you're different, I want you to meet me at this altar. If you know you're different. If you know you're different. But you, you got to go ahead on and accept that. You got to accept it. It's, it's not always a comfortable feeling being odd, you know? <laughs> I went to that meeting, guys, and those pastors in the room, 30 of them were Caucasian, two of us were black. Really didn't know. I was listening to them like they were giving their testimonies, and they say, this is gonna blow y'all mind. But they were giving their testimonies, and one, one man said, Oh my God, you know, God has been good to us. We just bought 500 acres cash. One person said, Oh my God, we had a $70 million fall, but we were able to raise it. I said, oh my God, we got some property and it has $7 million worth of back taxes on it. Thank God we were able to pay it off in 18 months. See, what happens when you get around people when their problems blow your mind? When the stuff they're struggling with is something you ain't never even dreamed about. But instead of being envious, my faith is stretched. Oh, I can buy 500 acres. I can ask God for $70 million and he'll do it in 18 months. He, he's no respecter of person. It's no secret what God can do, what he's done for us. He can do for you. Then I recognize that everybody at that table was odd, just like me. One man came up to me. I never met him in my life. He came, he said, there's something about you. He took his shoes off and said, I'm gonna stand and pray with you because there's something about you and it's like standing on holy ground like Moses. He put his hands on my shoulder and he began to pray. And when I looked at him, I was amazed because, you know, when they all gave their name, I was Googling them. <laughs> Every time I heard them say, hey, my name is da da da, I would Google them like, oh Lord, have mercy, get, get off my phone. And I thought, we're all odd. We're all called to break the cycle. We're all called to shake it up. And then they begin to share their stories. And this is why I'm going to pray for you because 
once I found out they were odd and they were telling their stories and all they had done, then what followed was how much pain they had gone through. Then I realized that God never used anybody greatly who didn't suffer greatly. Listen to this. God can never bless you above your pain tolerance. Wherever you start hurting, that's where he stops stretching. How bad can you hurt before you break? And that will determine how God can use you. I have had some painful days. <laughs> I've had some stuff hurt me so bad that it has wiped out months of my memory. Y'all don't hit. Do y'all? I know you may be tired of standing up, but I'm ministering to somebody. I've had some pain that happened to me so bad that my family will come and ask me, "Do you remember such and such?" And I can't even recall it. I can't even remember people I'm related to. I, I, and I'm not joking. I can't remember the day. I can't remember where we lived at that time. I can't remember the season. I, all I remember was the pain. My sister Kiana, she's around here somewhere, is my only point of reference to where I used to hurt because we were so close in age that wherever I was hurting, she was remembering. She has to remind me, you went to school with that person. I should remember that. Pain to erase your memory. I've had some stuff happen to me that only my mom knows about it. If I begin to tell you right now, you would weep for what we had to survive. But don't feel sorry for me. Because I got double for my trouble. Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, your double is coming. Your double is coming. Your double is coming. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Can I pray for you? What I want you to do, you got three minutes and 22 seconds, and I'm going to let you go. You've got, you got to work on this thing. I, I, you got to let it go because you've been called to disrupt the thing, but you can't be a disruptor if you're disturbed. Come on, y'all. Just come on. Get in that still place. You, you're almost there. I want you to just demand the devil let you go. Come on. Just demand it. Come on. Demand him to let you go. Let my mind go. Get your hands off of my self-esteem. Free me so I can be free. Free me so I can be whole. Give me my mind back. Give me my spirit back. Give me my soul back. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of weeping. Free me, oh God. Free me. Free me. Free me. Free me. Free me. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. God doesn't hate you. Free me. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Free me. Free me. I can't help my children if I'm bound. Free me. I can't minister to my wife if I'm confused. Free me. I can't, I can't support my husband if I'm still jealous. Free me. Can't be a good father because I'm still mad at my father. Can't be a good mother because I still hate my mother. Free me. I've been called to disturb and not be disturbed. God, free me. Free me from needing to understand why it happened. Free me from the need to understand why it happened. I don't know why that happened to my mother. I don't know why that happened to my father. I don't know why that happened to me. I don't know why that happened to my daughter. I don't know why that happened to my son, but I do know all things work together. Oh God, oh God, free us. Cleanse us with hyssop. Give us a fresh wind and a fresh oil. You got another minute and 18 seconds. You ought to be praying for you. You pray for you. 
Can you not watch with me for one minute? Come on, open up your mouth. Come on. Come on, open up your mouth. Come on, open up your mouth. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on, open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody's going to get free tonight. Somebody's going to get free. Everything. Come on, sing it, sing it. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing. I lay it at the altar. The Son has set free is free indeed. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Not because I'm in pain, but because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup is running over. Now somebody release a praise because surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all of the days of your life. Lift up your voice and give God a shout of praise. I'm not going to release you to your worship. Somebody got to act like Jacob. Lord, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. If my hip got to come out of socket, I'll hold on to you until you bless me. My children are waiting on this blessing. My money's waiting on this blessing. My relationship is waiting on this blessing. Come on and bless the Lord. set free it's free indeed God fill our barrels allow us to get home as planet shakers in business in politics at home in ministry let everything we touch respond to the oil in 
In Jesus' name we pray. Say amen. Hug somebody on your way out. Tell them I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it.